All right, so let's get started with a few capture filters, right? So I'm just going to uh, I'm just going to get rid of this capture file there. Continue without saving, and we can specify a capture filter, you know, within the actual capture filter toolbar here. So what I can do is, uh, you know, we I can give you a few examples. Now, capture filters and display filters are very different. We're not going to be focusing. Uh, too much time on capture filters because as i said that's not something that uh, you should be doing uh, but you know this is fairly simple you have the ability to filter by protocol so you know i can say tcp uh, that means that only tcp traffic or packets will be captured i can also say uh, you know UDP and essentially specify all the protocols uh, that i would like to filter you know so i can also say icmp so, you know, if I uh, if I type in ICMP and I say uh, I click on my actual interface there, uh, you can see that uh, that is only going to capture ICMP traffic. So if I say, uh, for example, if I head over into my browser and I perform an HTTP request, so I'm just going to resend that there and I take a look at Wireshark, you can see nothing is captured. If I, however, perform a ping, so I'm just going to say uh, ping uh, google.com, that's going to send uh, that's going to essentially uh, send an ICMP packet right because that's how pinging works and you can see in this case only ICMP packets are being captured however the problem with this is not all traffic is being captured which is what we want so let's go back into uh, the actual uh, the actual capture filter section so as i said you can filter uh, through protocols you can also uh, specify uh, you know whether you want uh, to limit the actual uh, packet capture to specific IPs. So for example, I can say source, uh, source, and I can then specify the IP that I would like to filter, you know, uh, that I would like to filter, right? So if I uh, only wanted to capture traffic that was being sent by a particular IP, maybe an IP like 10, 10, 10, um, let's see 31, that's our IP address or my IP address. I can say that, so source is 10, 10, 10, 31. I can then hit enter. And again, I'll just make another HTTP request here. And if we go back into Wireshark, you can see that it's only going to log traffic, uh, you know, that has been sent from this IP address. That's fairly simple to understand. Uh, and of course, we can again modify that and say, uh, you know, we can also change that to destination address. So I can say if the destination address is 10, 10, 10, 1, which is the default gateway on this NAT network, I can hit uh, enter and now this is only going to display packets uh, with the destination uh, header or you know field set to the IP address that we specified so uh, again that is fairly simple to understand so you know I can perform a quick ARP scan uh, using the net discover tool so I can say uh, you know I can say sudo net discover and uh, that would essentially uh, you know connect to that particular IP or I can just ping it so I can say ping 10 10 10 1 and uh, you can see we get a response and if we take a look at wireshark you can see it's only displaying uh you know it's only displaying packets uh you know where the destination is the ip that we specified irregardless of the protocol now one of the really cool features of both uh, the capture and display filters is the ability to chain or to use uh, logical operators uh, to essentially, uh, you know, make your filters much more robust in regards to the information you're looking for. So if I just, uh, you know, get rid of that there, I can combine filters with each other based on what I'm looking for. So if you're familiar with logical operators, if you've performed programming, I can use the AND operator, right? I can say AND, I can say OR, uh, I can also say not if I wanted to and uh, you know based on the type whether you're using a capture filter or display filter this will change so what I can say is I can say the source is going to be uh, you know let's say this is going to be our IP address or my IP address and then I can say and uh, I only want to dis to display ICMP packets so what's going to happen here is Wireshark is going to capture I is going to capture packets where the source IP address is set to uh, our our Ubuntu IP and the type of the packet or the protocol is going to be ICMP. So again, we'll just start the capture there. If I perform a request here, uh, you know, an HTTP request and I go back into Wireshark, you can see nothing captured there. However, if I perform a, um, a ping on, you know, something like google.com, and I'll just give that a couple of seconds. There we are. And I can go back here. 
you can now see it's only capturing those packets uh, regardless of the destination. So you can see that uh, that only captures packets where the source IP is the one we specified and the destination um, or rather the actual protocol is ICMP. Now let's explore a few other options. So I'm just going to get rid of this here and that's the ability to specify the port, right? Now the port can be specified uh, in the form of um, if we just click on this here, I can say, for example, port, uh, we can just say 80, right? So that's only going to limit it to port 80. However, in order to specify this, uh, you would essentially need to say, so, you know, we can essentially say source uh, is going to be, uh, you know, we can just specify the Ubuntu IP there and uh, you can, we can say 80, but of course that's not specified. So uh, we can essentially say as an example, uh, so, we can say TCP and 80, or uh, we can say and, and uh, we can just filter through that. So, you know, we can uh, limit the type of packet that we're capturing in regards to the protocol. So, you know, I can say, for example, uh, HTTP, and I would need to add a logical operator. So, uh, and HTTP, or, um, you know, we can customize the filters, uh, you know, based on a variety of parameters. So uh, as an example, I can say, uh, you know, instead of saying HTTP, I can say the source IP is the following and I only want you to display packets where the source IP is uh, what we've uh, outlined there and the destination or the actual port is port 80, right? So uh, that means any packet where the port is set to 80 uh, and the source IP is set to our Ubuntu IP address, we can say that as well. And this is not just limited to our IP, we can also specify any other IP within the actual subnet and that will work out just fine. So I can start that now. Um, so I'm just going to click on the interface there. If I make a request, that should be captured within Wireshark based on the capture filter. There we are. So uh, that is essentially how to use your capture filter. As I said, I don't want to spend too much time on capture filters. So let's get rid of this here and let's talk about, uh, let's talk about display filters. So I'll just get rid of the capture filter there. Make sure that that is always uh, that is always empty because if there is any capture filter, then it could potentially mess up. You know, in terms of the in terms of limiting uh, what types of packets you can capture. So uh, I'll click on my interface there, and I'm just going to give this a couple of seconds to capture a wide variety of packets. So HTTP packets. Uh, we can also throw in a couple of ICMP packets. So I'll just ping, I'll just perform a ping on google.com. And yeah, so we should be capturing quite a lot of traffic. So you can see this is capturing, uh, you know, packets, uh, you know, from multiple IP addresses uh, from the Kali Linux IP from other systems as well. Uh, you know, so for example, the actual IP address of the web server or the vulnerable virtual machine that we're going to be using for a couple of demonstrations, so on and so forth and uh, we can just stop that capture there. So your display filter is right at the top. Now, as I said, uh, the display filter uh, logical operators are going to be different uh, based, on, um, based on the fact that you're now dealing with the display filter. So let's take a look at a couple of examples here, right? So um, if I wanted to filter HTTP requests, I could say HTTP uh, request, there we are, and if I hit enter, that's going to filter and provide me with uh, all with only the packets uh, that uh, are essentially HTTP requests, as it does right over here. So you can see we requested the following website uh, that is uh, motilidayindex.php, and the web server is uh, the following IP here on port 80. The protocol is HTTP, right? I could also just limit it to only HTTP packets. So if I hit enter, that's going to display the entire range of HTTP packets. Uh, I can also filter by either TCP or, uh, you know, UDP and, uh, you know, based on what you specify, it will, it'll, you'll be able to filter through what you're looking for. So I could also say DNS, I can also say FTP, and you can see we didn't capture any FTP packets, SSH, so on and so forth, really any protocol that you want to use uh, or that you want to filter with, uh, you can. All right, so what if I wanted to specify a source and destination IP address and sort of use the logical operators to fine tune my uh, my actual display filter? Uh, so for example, I'll just hit enter to take me back to all the packets here. I could say, for example, the IP dot uh, source. So that's the source IP 
is going to be equal to, so we use the logical operator double uh, equal sign, that means equal to, and then we can say the source is 10, 10, 10, 31. And then uh, instead of saying and, we use the, uh, the double ampersand uh, symbols right over there. And we can then say the ip.dst is going to be equal to the IP address of uh, the actual web server. So in this case, it's 10, 10, 10, 33. And we can also say, and this is the one of the great things we can say, and uh, TCP dot, uh, you know, we could say TCP dot port is equal to port 80, right? So you can now start to see the power of Wireshark. So if I hit enter, that's going to limit the actual packets to, uh, to, to essentially meet the, the actual filter that we specified. So it's only displaying uh, packets where the source IP is our Ubuntu VM. The destination is the web server and the port is port 80. Now, if we get rid or we say another port, maybe like 21, you can see it didn't capture any traffic there. All right, so that's just one example. Let's take a look at uh, a couple of other important uh, capture filters. Now, another important piece of information that you typically be looking for, you know, within a local network is DHCP data. So I can do that by saying DHCP, hit enter. There aren't any DHCP packets. So, uh, you know, if I was to perform an ARP scan or a network discovery scan, for example, with uh, Nmap or NetDiscover, if I type in NetDiscover, you can see that doesn't exist. So I'm just going to install that utility here. So sudo apt get install NetDiscover, and uh, I'm just going to install that there. So I'll give that a couple of seconds. NetDiscover is a utility that allows you to discover uh, other IP addresses or hosts on a local network uh, by sending ARP requests and based on the responses, uh, you know, you're able to tell whether that device is, uh, is online or offline or is on the network or not. So I can say sudo net discover because this is also, uh, you know, essentially sending packets or ARP requests. Uh, ARP stands for the address resolution protocol. Uh, ARP is essentially used to resolve IP addresses to MAC addresses. So, you know, I could say sudo net discover I and then I would need to get my interface here. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, let me just uh, split another terminal. So I'll say if config and the name of my interface is ENP 0 S3. So ENP 0 S3 and the network range or the subnet is 10.10.10.1.24. 10, 10, 10, Hit enter. And that will start capturing ARP traffic. Now, before we do that, I'm going to start another capture here. So we'll get rid of that filter and we'll start another capture. Uh, remember, we don't have any uh, any uh, capture filter. We're going to be using display filters. So I'll just run the command again. And you should start uh, seeing ARP requests here. There we are. We can actually see it there. So we have, uh, you know, an ARP request. And if we take a look at the actual, um, the actual packet details pane here, if we click on the ARP protocol, uh, that tells us the actual type of request. So we have a request here. Do we have a response? Uh, let's see, that's a reply. So there we are, we have the response. So uh, ARP is essentially saying, or what ARP is used to say is it's essentially saying, uh, okay, who has this IP address? Can you please tell this IP? And then uh, we get a response. So you can see we get a reply. And yeah, so it's fairly simple to understand. Um, so yeah, that, that's just one example. As I said, uh, there are a couple of other important um, search filters or rather display filters we can use uh, in order to discover important information that uh, is typically important. So another important piece of info is uh, information like uh, NetBIOS. So uh, for example, if we're working on a an environment that has Windows systems, you can essentially identify uh, Windows systems on that network or packets that were sent or received by Windows system by saying NBNS. So I can say NBNS. We don't have any NBNS packets here. That's also quite useful. Uh, we have a couple of other examples that we can use. So, you know, we can uh, essentially use the HTTP filter, which is going to be quite important. So we can say HTTP uh, request or response. We can also limit it. Uh, you know, we can also identify or use the HTTP.cookie display filter if we hit enter nothing there so we could say http uh, dot cookie and there's multiple ways of using the actual uh, display filters 
So let's take a look at a couple of other filters. So I've already mentioned the IP uh, source and destination. You can also limit, uh, you know, what is displayed based on the IP address. So this will display all packets that have an IP address, uh, regardless of whether it's the source or destination IP. And you can specify the value there. So I can say 10, 10, 10, 33, hit enter. That's going to display, uh, you know, all the packets uh, that have that IP. So you can see in this case, the first packet uh, has that in the source. Uh, and the second one has it in the destination. So you can also filter based on a particular IP. Um, you can also uh, filter by IP ranges. Uh, that can be done by saying IP.address, and this is where the logical operators come into play. So I can say uh, greater than or equal to 10, 10, 10, uh, 1. So that's the first IP within the subnet. And then I can use the logical operator. So I can say and or the double ampersand. And I can say IP dot address, um, and this is where we specify the end of the range is less than uh, or equal to, uh, we can say 10, 10, 10, 33. So we're essentially saying only display packets within this IP range. So the IP range is 10, 10, 10, 1, and the actual uh, end of the range is 10, 10, 10, 33. I can hit enter, and as you can see, that's only going to display IPs, uh, you know, within that range. And of course, you, know, you, can, you can also customize this to be the source and destination based on your own uh, requirements. And of course, you can also chain this with a multiple uh, with multiple other filters. So, you know, I can essentially say TCP dot uh, port and you can also customize the destination port. So I can say destination port uh, is uh, let's say we can set that to uh, 80 and that's only going to display the packets that, uh, you know, that essentially meet those parameters. So. Uh, again, it's fairly simple to understand, and you know uh, you'll be in situations where you'll need to uh, you'll need to be able to chain multiple filters based on what you're looking for. So uh, an example of this would be uh, I'm just going to uh, stop that there, and I'm gonna uh, just run another capture here, and I'm just gonna uh, you know just uh, I'm just gonna reload this web page. That's an HTTP request. So uh, an example of this would be when you're working or you're trying to analyze what happened on a network and you're trying to identify infections via a malicious document, for example, uh, that came through a particular website or an attachment. Uh, you know, I could say the IP address, I could say um, IP address, uh, sorry, IP address is equal to 10, 10, 10, um, let's see, 31. And I, I can then say and HTTP dot request there we are. And uh, I can just hit enter, right? So I can then limit what I'm looking for based on the source IP or rather, uh, you know, the IP address itself. And I can then view, uh, you know, for example, uh, the, the various HTTP requests and there's multiple ways I can filter. So for example, I can say HTTP uh, request and then I can also say that is equal to um, let's see if I can do this here. So no, I need to say HTTP request dot method is equal to, for example, if this was a post request where I was sending data, I could hit enter and that limits it to a post request. Uh, there's also a couple of other ones that are quite important, like the HTTP host filter. So I can say host and that will essentially limit it to uh, HTTP hosts, the various HTTP hosts. And I can then specify a host name. So if there is a, uh, a relevant host name, I can specify that as well. In this case, uh, I know that there isn't. Um, you also have the ability to filter based on uh, Ethernet, right? So if you're working within the data link layer, I can also say Ethernet dot address, and then I can specify the MAC address that I'm looking for. So, uh, you know, I could say, for example, Ethernet uh, dot destination or dot address and obtain my MAC address. So uh, if I just open up a new tab here, I can get the MAC address for my interface. Uh, let's see where I can find that there. That should be displayed. There we are, Ethernet. So I'll copy that there. And I can say IP uh, Ethernet address um, equal to the following. So I can paste that in there. And uh, you, as I said, there's you can filter uh, you can essentially use filters to display packets based on various layers of the OSI model, not just limited to the network layer or the transport layer or the application or presentation layer. Um, so there's multiple, uh, you know, 
uh, filters that you can utilize. As I said, uh, we'll be taking a look at them uh, and uh, a few other interesting ones as we explore the exercises. All right, so what I want to explore now is protocol filtering, right? So I'm just going to stop that capture and we're going to take a look at a few examples, right? So um, I'll just begin the capture in a couple of seconds, but what we're going to be doing is we're going to be making a few requests or interacting with uh, the target uh, system through various protocols. So we'll take a look at uh, DNS, FTP, Telnet, HTTP, uh, HTTPS as well, that's perfectly fine, and SSH. So the objective is to try and view traffic uh, based on a particular protocol. And we'll also be uh, taking a look at streams, right, and how streams can be used. So as I've already explained, I'm just going to start the capture there. Uh, we've already explored DNS, right? So I can just uh, clear that out there and I can say ping or, uh, yeah, we can say ping google.com to view the actual uh, DNS request and response. So when we're saying ping, uh, what our system will do initially is it will uh, essentially reach out to our your primary DNS server and it'll say, okay, can you please tell me the IP address of google.com so that I can make a request, regardless of whether it's an HTTP request or an ICMP request. So if we take a look at Wireshark, uh, you can see we have DNS at the top here. And of course, we can filter uh, by, by protocol. So we can say DNS. So you can see this is the standard query where we're essentially saying, uh, okay, so uh, who has, if we take a look at the queries here, we're, we're essentially saying, uh, could you pre please provide us with the, uh, the the type A DNS record for google.com, which means, could you please provide us with the IPv4 address for google.com? We then get the actual... Um, the actual uh, query response. Uh, this is also the request for the IPv6 uh, address. As you can see, type is specified there. We then get the response for IPv4, whereby it tells us, okay, uh, the IP for google.com, uh, and then it provides us with the IP address, right, for google.com, so that we can actually um, so that we can actually connect to that uh, to that server. So you can see the answer here is google.com. The type A DNS record is the following. So that's uh, that's essentially telling uh, my computer what IP address to connect to because computers don't know what Google.com is; they only know IP addresses, and it does the same for the IPv6 IP address. So uh, again, if you ever want to filter via DNS, you can do that as well. You can also filter via DNS records. So I can say DNS A, and if I hit enter, you can see it's only going to display the response where the A address or the uh, A DNS record which means the IPv4 address is displayed. And you can see we have another example here whereby the browser has made a, a request to the following uh, address uh, that is contel.services.mozilla.com and it provides us with the IP address for that particular domain. So, you know, DNS is fairly simple to understand. All right, the next protocol that we're going to be exploring is FTP. Now, as I said, there is a uh, vulnerable uh, Linux server that's running on within this particular subnet or within the NAT network that has the IP address 10.10.10.33. And it has uh, various services running on it. So it has, it has an FTP server. Uh, it also has Telnet, a web server, as we've already been able to tell. And it also has SSH running. So what we can do is let's um, let's perform or let's try and authenticate with the target via FTP. So I'm going to say FTP and then specify the actual uh, target IP address and then the port in in this case is port 21. So I can say I can just provide the credentials MSF admin and MSF admin. And uh, hopefully I typed in the password correctly. So I'm just going to exit and try that again. So M MSF admin and msf admin again and there we are so authentication was successful so i can say dir to list out the contents of this directory and if i head back into wireshark i can then limit it uh, i can then filter the packets based on the protocol ftp and uh, you can see that uh, we can actually uh, we, because we're capturing all the traffic we can actually intercept the packets being sent and you can see that uh, there was a response here and we have uh, the actual uh, username specification or the authentication where the username was specified as MSF admin. And uh, because FTP in this context is not encrypted, the passwords can be identified. So that was the incorrect password that I specified, as you can see there, login incorrect. 
and it then tells us to re-authenticate and we specify the correct password and there we are. So why is this important? Well, this is very important because you could potentially identify brute force attacks or incorrect attempts whereby an attacker was trying to gain access, so on and so forth, right? So that's FTP. Uh, again, if you take a look at uh, the other um, the other packets that were captured, when we typed in DIR, so there we are, uh, here comes directory listing. We actually typed in DIR to get a, a, a directory listing of the current working directory. And you can see that we actually get a response there as well. Now, one of the great things is if we right click on a particular packet, we can follow the TCP stream to essentially, um, to essentially put everything together because uh, streams are very helpful to essentially see how a protocol communicates in the way that the application layer sees it. So, uh, you know, the application layer um, uh, essentially uses streams whereby, uh, you know, you have multiple packets with multiple uh, pieces of data uh, in the form of streams. And, uh, you know, from our perspective, it can be really hard to tell what's going on. And uh, you'll actually see this when we'll be working with Telnet. But if I say follow the FTP stream, it essentially tells me what happened in a way that makes sense to me. So you can see uh, the actual service banner for the version of the FTP server running on the target. I then authenticated using the username MSF admin. And in this case, I provided the wrong password and it told us login incorrect. I then logged in again so on and so forth. But this is only pertinent to this request or this authentication attempt, right? Now, if I uh, try to, if I uh, clicked on the other FTP, so for example, I click on uh, this one here and I say, follow TCP stream. It now provides me, um, that's still the incorrect one. Uh, let's see if I can identify the other login here. So uh, where did I specify the correct uh, password? Uh, that was the username there. And then I believe that I was able to authenticate. Oh, it's still showing the display filter there. So if I click on, uh, you know, if I head over here and uh, we click on the actual uh, packet pertinent to the, to the actual, there we are. So that's the one there. So we can click on follow TCP stream. You can see now it provides me uh, with the stream pertinent to the successful authentication with FTP. Right, so uh, streams are very important. So let's take a look at Telnet. Now, as you know, Telnet is unencrypted, which means if we authenticate, we should be able to see the, the, the actual password in clear text. All right, so I'll get rid of the, that display filter there and I'll just exit from FTP here and I'll say Telnet. Uh, and, uh, you know, we can essentially specify the target IP there. So 10, 10, 10, 33, hit enter and I'll say MSF admin and msf admin for the password and we're logged in ls there we are so let's filter i'm just going to stop the capture there and let's filter uh for ftp right uh rather for telnet uh so i can either say telnet or i can say tcp dot port based on the protocol is equal to 23 which is the default telnet port and i can hit enter and we have the same thing going on here so uh you know we can click on the first packet sent so i can say follow the TCP stream. All right, so you can see that this displays the entire authentication, um, the, the, you know, essentially whatever we did, or this essentially joins every packet together, uh, every, uh, every Telnet packet, uh, and it displays it in a way that makes sense to us, right? But uh, in the back end, uh, you know, it sends it in individual packets or in individual streams. So I'll give you an example of this. Let me see if I can identify where the authentication was actually, uh, where the authentication actually begun, right? So if I click on Telnet data here and we have the data there, uh, let's see what is displayed there. So there we are, we can see the individual fields. So if you went by it uh, by a packet by packet basis, you can see uh, in this packet, the M was sent. In the next one, the S was sent. So M, S, F, A, D, uh, sorry, A, D, M, I, N. So that's why the actual stream for a particular packet is very important. So, you know, based on the protocol, so it could be a TCP stream, UDP, TLS, FTP, etc. In this case, it's TCP. You can now see it essentially uh, gives me the entire stream or essentially, uh, you know, it essentially allows us to see uh, what was going on, right? So in this case, we can see this was the uh, Telnet banner. It asks, uh, it asks us for the username, and you can see in this case, it's uh, not being displayed clearly, and we have the ability to filter 
or to change how the data is displayed to us, we can either display it in UTF-8 format as raw. So this is raw data. We can also display it in ASCII format, which is readable. Uh, in C arrays, if you want to as well, so hex as well. So that's fantastic there, and you can uh, you can see the actual offsets there for for M S F admin etc. So uh, you know Wireshark is really really awesome. So you know you can view the entire uh, the entire conversation or limit it to uh, a, a particular. Uh, set of communication based on the IPs there. I can also search for, for example, username. I can say username. Does Is anything displayed there? Can I filter by password? There we are. So a uh, really, really, really cool. Um, so that's Telnet. That's uh, fantastic. Um, now let's talk a little bit about exporting this capture, uh, this packet capture into a PCAP file. So if I wanted to do that, I can click on this icon here. I can say save this packet capture computer um, I can save this under home, Alexis, on my desktop, and I can give it a name. So I can say Telnet, uh, Telnet PCAP, and I'll select the format as PCAP and save. And uh, I can now minimize that and I'll head into my desktop here. And you can see we have the PCAP file. So I can now share this with anyone in the world. And if they have Wireshark installed, they can open it up with Wireshark. So there we are, it opens up with Wireshark and I can now navigate through the actual packet capture uh, within that PCAP file. So really, really cool stuff there. All right, so uh, that is how to export a uh, packet capture into a PCAP file. Now that we've taken a look at that, uh, we can also explore SSH traffic if you're interested in that because that is quite important. So uh, what we'll do is we will get rid of that there and uh, we can then uh, you know start a new capture there and i'll just exit from the actual uh, ftp connection there and i can authenticate by saying ssh um, msf admin at the actual ip so 10 10 10 33 hit enter i'm going to accept and i'm going to just provide the password and remember uh, one of the reasons why ssh was the successor to Telnet was the fact that it encrypted communication. So in this case, we shouldn't be able to see the actual password. So I'll just switch over here and it looks like, uh, yeah, the packets are being captured and we can just stop the capture there. And I can say SSH, there we are. And now you can see uh, where we have the encrypted packets. Uh, that's where the actual passwords uh, and communication was being sent. And in this case, uh, unless we have the actual um, unless we have the, uh, you know, the actual uh, SSH key pair, we cannot decrypt this. If we did, then we would be able to, de de to actually decrypt uh, these particular packets. So uh, that is SSH traffic. Again, you can filter or use any display filter you want to use. Now, uh, let's talk about HTTP traffic, and then we'll move on to our exercise, which will be to decrypt HTTPS traffic and take a look at a an infection. So what I'll do here is I'm going to get rid of this uh, capture there and um, I'm going to uh, begin a capture and I'll head over into the actual web application that is hosted on uh, the web server or the vulnerable server. You can see that's the IP there. The, uh, this is a vulnerable web application called Mutilidae. And because this is this uh, doesn't this website or web app doesn't have an SSL certificate, it means that communication between the client, which is my browser, and the server is unencrypted. So if a user was to log in with credentials like maybe admin admin, and I hit log in, regardless of whether those credentials are correct, that should actually be captured by Wireshark. So if I hit enter, uh, you can see that we have quite a lot of data that was captured. Right, and let's take a look at how to use the actual um, the actual packet coloring here to, uh, you know, how, how that can be useful from a security analyst perspective. So um, I'm just going to stop that there. And what we'll do is let's open up view and the coloring rules. And let's say I only want to display uh, HTTP post requests, right? So, and I want to have, uh, I want to give that its own unique color so that whenever I capture traffic again, or whenever I import a PCAP file, and uh, you know, based on my own personal requirements, I can identify those packets based on their color. 
So I'll, open, I'll create a new coloring rule and I'll call this, uh, we'll call this HTTP post, right? And the filter in this case is going to be, uh, we will say HTTP.request and uh, the, we're going to say request method is going to be equal to uh, post, right? So we're only, we're only looking for post requests. And post requests uh, typically mean that, uh, you know, we're interacting with a login form, etc. And now for the color, we want to change the background color to something. Let's use something that's uh, easily identifiable, maybe this very bright pink there. And I can then enable it by checking the actual checkbox there. And if I hit OK now, you can now see that the actual coloring allows me to easily identify a particular type of packet that might be interesting to me. Right, so if I right click on this packet and I say follow TCP stream, uh, you can see that uh, in this case it essentially shows me the entire post request. And because the connection is unencrypted, we have the username and password there for the web application, which again gives us the HTTP status code 200 OK, which means authentication was successful. This information can also be obtained from the actual packet details pane. So uh, if we take a look, uh, let me make sure I'm clicked on it there. We have the HTML form there and you can see the username field for that form is specified or rather the information that was sent is specified. Now, as I said, this will work regardless of whether or not it's our IP address. It can be any IP on the network. And if they're authenticating to an unsecured website, then, uh, you know, this is going to be a problem. Uh, but yeah, all I wanted to showcase is how you can utilize filters and, uh, you know, essentially filter through protocols and find what you're looking on, uh, looking for based on your requirements. So I'll just uh, go into the coloring rules there and I'll get rid of that coloring rule because again, I don't need it. So there we are. Okay, fantastic. I just want to take a couple of moments to thank our Patreons. Thank you, Michael Hubbard, Dustin Umpress, Jerry Speds, Doozy, Sid Saab, Ryan Carr, Shamir Douglas, Jojo BB, Palangos, Kushkev, RS, Nino Buikov, and David Bricker. You guys are really awesome. Thank you very much for supporting us. And you guys make these types of videos possible. So we really appreciate it. And we look forward to producing even more high quality content.